Well, hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome to the beautiful National Museum of the American Indian, and this is our Rasmussen Theater, and we are celebrating the power of chocolate. We've been doing this festival now for several years, and of course, we celebrate chocolate here at our museum. We try to tie it in with the larger cultural celebration of Valentine's Day, because chocolate is a traditional gift. But we at the museum want everybody to know that chocolate is a gift from the native peoples of Central America to the world. They were the first to develop uh, the cacao plant into chocolate treats that we now know today as hot chocolate, cold chocolate drinks, and things like that, and of course candy. And this session right now that's about to start is uh, a cooking demonstration with our uh, executive chef of the Mitzatom Cafe, Chef Richard Hetzler, and his, his, his able chef, Jerome Grant, is right here helping him out. And just so everybody knows, uh, the way that we're setting up this year, obviously you won't be able to see right here necessarily what he's doing, but you'll be able to see right behind on the screen what he is doing. And then also we want to welcome everybody that is watching us by live webcast. So say folks that are watch say hi to folks that are watching from their computers. <laughs> so Richard is going to take you through some wonderful stuff. He'll talk about a new uh, cookbook that he has produced that's available for purchase and, you know, what he does here at the museum with... Uh, the wonderful native foods of the Americas. So please join me in welcoming Chef Richard Hetzler. Thank you. So you guys can hear me okay with this? This is actually the first time we've done a cooking demo in the theater on stage. So I gotta say, I've never seen myself from behind. So that's actually <laughs> pretty interesting. I keep checking myself out, see how I look. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about chocolate today. We're gonna talk you know, a little bit about what makes up chocolate, what is chocolate, what we know is chocolate, kind of a little bit about the history of chocolate, and then we're going to do some sweet and savory dishes with chocolate. And what we like to do when we do, like I said, like Vinny was saying, is we've done this for many years now. Um, and what we try to talk about when we're doing these demos is chocolate not only is a sweet, I think most people recognize chocolate as a dessert only, but there's really a lot of applications in you know, everyday cooking that if you're a little creative and you kind of think outside the box, you can really have some fun and do some unique dishes with it. With that being said, you know, we do on South America, we have kind of a tapa station over there. Every item on that station this weekend has chocolate in it, in one form, shape, or another, in savory and in sweet. So you really get to try and see some different unique things that you can do with chocolate. And there's a lot of fun stuff, so with it being kind of that small plate, you can really recreate and taste some different stuff and have a lot of fun with it. So, let's talk about what chocolate really is. And while I talk about that, I'm going to start melting some chocolate. We're going to use a double boiler to melt chocolate. That's why I've got some hot water going. And in, in that, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to put some, uh, some white chocolate. And we're going to start melting down a little bit of white chocolate. We use white chocolate coins. If everybody could see them, they're very small coins. What that does for us is back in, when I first started cooking, everything was in about 8 to 10 pound kilos. So it was about a 15 or 20 pound block of chocolate. So you had a chef sitting up there with a knife about this size for about two hours just, just going through chocolate to get enough chocolate to be able to use. Now, through innovation, we've, we've been able to really uh, change it and it makes it a lot easier for the end user, for us as chefs. And then most of the, you know, most everyday people can buy it as well. Now you can see white chocolate melts fairly quickly. I'll try to get a shot in the camera for you. White chocolate actually melts really quick. White chocolate is one of those chocolates that can actually burn before it actually touches heat or if it actually gets too hot. So a lot of times what will happen is on white chocolate, if you've ever been cooking chocolate at home and got a drop of water in it and seen what happens, it kind of seizes up and starts to look like a, a, a jumbled mess or it looks like it seizes, it makes like a hard chocolate. White chocolate will do the same thing just with the, on the fire. So I'm going to pull that off and let it, just let it finish melting down. That's going to be for one of the dishes we're going to make. We're actually going to do a white chocolate and braised rabbit empanada. So we're going to incorporate white chocolate into the empanada dough. We're going to braise the rabbit down with other components of chocolate. So who knows what's in chocolate? Anybody out there? What about you down in front? Do you know what's in chocolate? Milk. Milk is in it. What else? Cocoa, there you go. That's the key ingredient in chocolate. So, cocoa beans. Cocoa beans, and I, I wish I don't have an actual plant up here that I could show you. But basically what it is, is if you've ever seen the pod of a, a cocoa, uh, the cacao plant, it's essentially almost looks like a green cocoon. And when you open it up, it's got a white membrane in it, and then there's seeds inside. 
Those seeds are what you see here, cocoa beans. These beans, let's see, does that work when I do that? Perfect. These beans, what happens is, and the unique thing is, is these beans are then dried and fermented. So by drying and fermenting them, they bring out the acid in it, the natural acid that's already in the, in the cocoa, in the cacao or in the cocoa bean. So from there, what happens is they need to extract stuff from it to be able to make chocolate. Now back in the old days, they didn't. What they would do was they would take this, they would take and just rough grind it using either a mortar and pedestal, and then they would just simply put it in hot boiling water because, of course, most Native Americans didn't have milk back then. Um, and they would use this piece, of, this tool right here. This is called a molinino. A molinino is what they would use for the first actual hot chocolates. This is actually a tool that they would use to froth the hot chocolate. So when the, when the hot water and the cocoa beans sat in here, this would actually go into the pot. You would kind of go back and forth with it. You can see it kind of makes like a fun little sound, a little, all the little ridge, ridges start moving. It would froth it up. And the more froth you had, the better they said the chocolate was. So they would use straight that. It was a very, very bitter drink because they weren't adding sugar. They weren't adding a lot of other ingredients to it. So it was, it's a lot different than what we think of or what we know as hot chocolate today. Most of our hot chocolate today, we add sugar. It's done with milk or, you know, a milk base of some sort. So we've, from the cocoa beans, then what happens is, is now with the wonderful world of technology, they, they basically put it into a centrifuge. And they separate the cocoa bean and the cocoa butter. So you got this separated out to this. So you're left with just a dried bean that they grind up, and that's what they make cocoa with. And then you take the cocoa butter, the cocoa, and add other ingredients, and that's how you get the percentages of chocolate that we know of today. So chocolate really has really changed over the years in the sense that, you know, if we think we go to the store and we buy a Hershey's bar and we get a piece of chocolate. But they're really starting to do a lot of stuff with chocolate in the sense of like they were doing with wines, and they're actually putting them on grading systems. Single origin chocolates. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen at the stores, but you can buy eight, nine dollar chocolate bars now, single origins from maybe from Guatemala or you know from the Ivory Coast or something like that. So there's a lot of different you know things that are happening in the chocolate world, and each one of those areas gives a different flavor or a different note to the chocolate. Some are fruitier and sweeter. Some are more of a caramelly note, stuff like that. So then what they do, once you extract out the cocoa butter, you know. You make your different blends. So now this is a representation of what a different blend would be. So by, like I said, by adding the different amount of cocoa, the cocoa butter, sugar, and milk solids, you get your different blends. So this is what a, this was what would re represent a milk chocolate. So you can see there's not a lot of chocolate into it. There's some milk fat. There's a lot of cocoa butter. So this is going to be about you know a milk chocolate blend. You know, milk chocolate blend meaning they've added more milk powder into it. To get a dark chocolate, it's going to kind of be something like what you have here. You're going to have a lot of cocoa and a little bit of sugar, and that's going to give you your dark chocolate. So when you see like these 74% blends and the different blends of chocolate, all it is is the amount of cocoa butter to the amount of cocoa that goes into it. So the more of the cocoa, the, the dried cocoa that goes into it, it's a higher process, it's a higher percentage of, of chocolate. So that's the difference. Now what about something like this? What do you think this is? White chocolate. Now the interesting thing about white chocolate is white chocolate really isn't chocolate. White chocolate, in order for anything to be called chocolate, in the sense to be true chocolate in, in the United States, it has to have cocoa, cocoa in it. It doesn't, white chocolate technically does have, it has no cocoa. It uses cocoa butter, it uses milk solid and milk, and milk powder. So it's kind of a play on words using those same ingredients, but then they were able to, you know, they call it, you know, white chocolate. So we're going to use white chocolate. Now the nice thing is white chocolate gives you different, different flavor characteristics, characteristics than the dark chocolate. And as a chef, and as we're talking about what we're able to do and how we're able to make different stuff savory and sweet, you know, we can use cocoa by itself in the raw form in ingredients and still give a cocoa flavor but not have the sweetness. We can use a 74% chocolate to make a soup or make something else that's going to give you that kind of bitterness. You're still going to get some sweetness off of it. By adding different flavor profiles to it, we're able, though, to make it more of a savory soup than a sweet soup. So you really can do a lot of different stuff with it. 
And then, of course, you can just take and make you know, hot chocolate or you can make cakes and different stuff like that with it. So while this is melting, we're going to work on the masa dough. So I've got some uh, the white chocolate melting. I'm going to melt down a little bit of butter to go into that. Because, again, we're making a masa dough. So the masa, we want to... Uh, we need to incorporate some kind of fat into it to keep it moist. If not, it would be very dense and dry when you cook it. So we can melt these two down together, and it'll work out pretty well. Now, we talk about how to melt chocolate and what we do with chocolate. Double boilers are always the best method for melting chocolate. Again, it can still be burned if you're doing it that way. But... You know, if you're careful, you can do it. You can also use a microwave. A microwave is a good thing. You never want to put your chocolate directly over an open flame. If you do, you're definitely going to burn it because it just doesn't do well to direct heat. The other thing is, like I talked about, is water. Why water and chocolate don't mix? There's actually the cocoa butter in this is what is allergic basically to the water. So if you get a drop of water in it, the cocoa butter seizes back up. Now you can fix that in one way. You can actually add like vegetable oil back into it. You can thin it back out that way. It's a little trick that we do. And a lot of times, like if you're working with chocolate, say you need to do, you know, if you wanted to do it like a chocolate coated strawberry or something, you could use a, a chocolate that's not maybe as good a quality as like, you know, like a Hershey's or something like that and add a little bit of vegetable oil in it. It'll thin it out and it'll make it easier for dipping your chocolates as well. So a couple little tricks that, that you can do. So now this is kind of melting down. I'm going to let that butter finish melting in there. And what I'm going to do is I've got some masa flour. Masa is essentially just a fine, fine dust, fine ground cornmeal that we're going to grind, that's been grind very, very fine. Let's see if I can get that in there for you. Ah, see, I caught her off guard that time. Just a real fine cornmeal. Um, there's a couple different varieties. We use, we use the Maseka, which is the, the, the finer ground, just because it works better for our purposes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of the, the Maseka to, to the bowl here. We'll just add the whole thing, make it easier. I'm going to put some gloves on because, again, we're, we're going to be working this with our hands, so this way it'll just be easier to clean. That's the only real reason. We don't worry about any of that other fun stuff that might get in there. You know, your hands are always clean as a chef. That's what, they, that's what we say at least, right? <laughs> so to, into here, I've, my butter and my chocolate mixture is just about all melted. And my sous chef put this together for me. If you guys haven't seen, we're in the process of opening a new, uh, well, we just opened a new coffee bar. I say not in the process any longer. But we've opened a new Mitsutama Espresso. We opened a new coffee bar um, right outside of the Mitsutama. So there's espressos, cappuccinos, and lattes and stuff. Now, you might say, how is that Native American? Well, the interesting thing about what we've done is we actually, we source all our coffee from a Native American roaster out of Cherokee, North Carolina, and then use, so she sources from indigenous coffees from around the world and then blends them and stuff. But I can tell you, after tasting, I had them here all day yesterday, it put Starbucks to shame. So anybody that likes Starbucks, that has to come by and check it out. So I'm going to put our white chocolate and our butter mixture into our maseka or into our masa flour. And I'm just going to kind of start working that around. And essentially what we want to make is we want to make a dough. And you can see how this really sucks up a lot of that you know, how much moisture this stuff, this, the masa really sucks up. I mean, that was a lot of butter. That was probably about three quarters of a pound of butter, and that was probably about five ounces of uh, white chocolate. You can see it kind of comes out to kind of a crumbly mess. So I've got my water. So we're going to add just a touch of water, and all we want to make is just a nice dough. And now masa, in the sense, there's no flour in it. So it's gluten-free. So anybody that is gluten-free, is, it's, a, it's a great option for you. But the nice thing is is that, you know, without adding, adding that flour, you're really keeping it natural to its, its natural form and shape. It, um, it's a little more difficult to work with in the sense that you can't necessarily roll it out as well with a rolling pin. And I'll show you what I mean in a second on that. I've got some already done. So now we've got our kind of flour coming together. You can kind of see how it kind of comes together, forms a ball. We can kind of mash it. It stays together. That's about what we're looking for um, on our product. 
I'm going to put just a little bit of salt and pepper into it. You can see this is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of ingredients that went into this. The butter is really for moisture. The, um, the masa, you get the corn flavor, and then you're getting that egg, the, the white, um, white chocolate. That's what we're here for today, right? Chocolate. Yes. Chocolate. <laughs> so the white chocolate. Now, I've got a little bit I've already done. What happens is once you make the dough, it's like anything else. You want to kind of let it rest for a few minutes just to make it easier. Move some of this other stuff out of our way. So now that we've got it, this is kind of a finished look on the dough. And you can kind of see, again, like I was saying, you, if you break it off, you know, it's not like bread where you would get that kind of gluten buildup because, again, there's no gluten in it. But it forms together nicely. It's got a little bit of oil on the outside of it. Now, that the way you can do masa or the, the empanada dough is with the magic of my sous chefs, I have some already done. It's amazing how that works. But the best way to do it is if we were doing it, I'd want to have, say, some parchment paper like this. I would take that dough, kind of just roll it up into a small, small ball in my hand. So, you know, about the size of, you know, a half dollar or a very big marble. You want to put it between two pieces of parchment paper. And then you can actually just take and flatten it out and then use a rolling pin if you had one. Or you can use your hand like I'm doing now. Everybody thinks cooking so difficult. It's just about using your hands. So, but what this does is it really allows you to be able to work with that dough. Because if you try to do it any other way, you can see how it even tries to stick a little bit here. But I can kind of slowly peel back. And it allows you to be able to work with that dough to, to be able to get it off and be able to work with it a little bit easier. Now, like I said, we're making, you know, rabbit. Um, and white chocolate and rabbit braised empanada. So, of course, we have to have... The, our little friend here. I'll let you get that. There's always got to be the wow factor. Everybody says, oh, <laughs> it's really good. I've got a picture in my office, and it's about four little bunnies, and it says they really taste good. They really, really do. <laughs> I know, it's terrible, but you know. That's what chefs do. We eat everything. So what we're going to do is we want to braise this. And what do we mean by braising? Braising is a cooking technique that chefs use, you know, really that dates back to Native American and, you know, I, uh, since the beginning of time, really, of cooking. And braising means you're cooking in a liquid to add flavor or you're taking a tougher cut of meat that you don't necessarily want to spend, you know, 8, 12, 14 hours cooking on an open fire. You can braise it. It means it's cooking in liquid. And then, but the nice thing we have is by doing that, we can actually add flavorings to it. So what we would do is we would take our rabbit and we'd get broken down into quarters. Um, and then we're going to add a few ingredients to it. We've got some red wine. We've got some, some um, duck fat. Of course, fat, you know, being a chef, that's what we do. <laughs> it is actually very, very good. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily make the meat fatty, but you're, you're imparting that flavor. The well, first thing I learned when I went to culinary school was fat is flavor. And really, it really is. McDonald's in the old days used to fry all their french fries in beef fat until everybody found out. So hence why McDonald's fries were always so good. Except for ours. Ours are, ours are better. We do ours in duck fat. So when you guys can, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, but what we would do is that would go into a pot. You need a pot big enough that you could put it into. Um, and then we're going to add some ingredients to it. So we've got some onions. And I'm going to sharpen my knife here because it's uh, pretty dull. If I could find the steel that I brought up. There we go. So we're going to sharpen our knife real quick. A dull knife will cut you faster than a sharp knife in the kitchen. That's a very, very important tool to remember, something to remember. Because what happens is, and the reason that is, and everybody says, well, how is that possible? Well, if you've got a dull knife and you're trying to wedge through this thing and you're pushing as hard as you can push, well, when it goes through, if your finger's in the way, what's going to happen? Yep, it's going to hurt. So if you've got a sharp knife, you use less pressure and it goes through. Chances are you can get your finger out of the way quicker if you need to. So we're going to take in. All we're going to do is basically just a rough dice on these onions because we don't need a lot. We don't, well, they're going to be removed at the end. We're not really going to use them. We're just kind of using them as flavor. In the, in the kitchen, we call it mirepoix. Mirepoix refers to, and if anybody's ever seen it on the cooking shows or maybe in a cookbook or something, mirepoix means carrots, onions, and celery. 
And all that is is just a way to kind of flavor, a way to just use it as a, um, you know, to help impart some other flavor into what we're cooking. So we've got some, uh, some onions going into our pot. We've got a carrot going in there. So again, the mirepoix part. I don't buy peelers. I just peel them this way. It's just easier for me. It's just another tool you have to worry about cleaning. Anybody have any questions about chocolate so far? I'm sorry? Cocoa butter is made from the extraction of the cocoa bean. So what they do is when they get, once they dry out the cocoa beans, they put it in basically into a, a large, uh, large spinning machine, and basically by doing that, it extracts the cocoa butter out of it. And then they're left with just the, the raw bean that they'll dry out some more, they'll toast off, and then they, buy, they, they combine all those ingredients back together to actually make cocoa or to make the chocolate that we know of today. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Like I said, if you think about, you know, over the years how chocolate kind of came together and what we know of as chocolate from where it started to where it is now, it's kind of an interesting, interesting little uh, piece, uh, how they figured out how to do all these different things to be able to make it work. Now you can see we're adding a lot of ingredients in to something that you wouldn't necessarily think for to go with chocolate. So now we're gonna, our celery is going to go into our pot. I've got, this is the raw cocoa butter, so I'll put some of that in there so we can, uh, we can actually use that for a little bit of fat to kind of start going off with this. And then we've got a little bit of garlic. So again, you're thinking garlic and chocolate, but you really, if you think about garlic when you roast it, the sweetness of it with the white chocolate actually go very well together. You can see I'm not dicing anything up very big. I've got about four or five sprigs of thyme. I've got a little bit of cinnamon that's going to go in there because, again, I want to be able to flavor this. I'm looking at trying to pull out these flavors and then add stuff to it. I've got a little bit of allspice that I'm going to put in there, about four or five kernels of allspice, some whole black pepper. We've got a little bit of white chocolate, and I'm also going to do some cocoa nibs or some cocoa in there. So all I'm going to do with these is kind of just give them a quick chop. And that's just going to go right in there. Now we're going to take our, our little friend here. We're going to take off his hind leg there. See, if this was a chicken, you guys wouldn't be saying that. <laughs> you know? It's just because it's a rabbit. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh. So. I know. You guys think I'm the coolest guy in the world right now. I know you do. <laughs> For all the kids in the audience, it's... It's really not that bad. It's chicken. No. Nah. <laughs> so, so we're gonna put the we're gonna put our we're gonna put we're gonna put the meat in the pot. <laughs> we won't call it. A, we won't say that anymore. Okay. I don't want to offend anybody. So the meat goes in the pot. Essentially, what we would do: red wine and chicken fat would go in here. It would get covered, and we'd slow cook this for probably about four and a half to five hours. So. You know, like I said, if we talked about, you know, braising versus like a, a, slong, a long, slow roast, you know, really we can have something done in about half the time. So, you know, again, it would get covered, it would go in the oven, it would, you know, like I said, about, about three to four hours later, we'd pull it out, and then we would turn around, let's set this back here, and we would turn around and we'd pull the meat, and essentially what we'd be left with is what, what I have here, and I'll put it into here. See, now you don't even know. Yeah, it looks just like chicken, see? Exactly. Nobody would know. So, so now we've got, but what we've done is by cooking it in the duck fat with the chicken, I mean with the um, garlic and the allspice and the cinnamon 
and the cocoa nibs, we've actually imparted a lot of those flavors into this meat. So this meat's going to have those tones. It's going to have those underlying flavors. And as chefs, that's what we do every day. We look at building flavors. In reality, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, it's very hard. I'm, I'm not a very good cook. But, you know, it's really about repetition and practice. The more you do it, the easier it gets. The more you can start understanding how flavors work together, you could then start figuring out how to make, how to put ingredients together that, that are appealing to everybody. You know, and you might have some failures, you might have some successes, but, you know, you would never know until you try. I did a habanero, a habanero chocolate dipped shrimp one time that everybody around me said, you are absolutely out of your mind, nobody's going to eat it. And we sold about 500 orders in one night. It, was, it just went, it flew away. Because it was something different that people never tried. When they got to taste it, they were like, wow, this is actually amazing. It worked real good. Now, we didn't use a sweet chocolate. We used, you know, about an 85% bitter sweet chocolate. So it really didn't have any sweetness. You got the heat from the habanero, but you got the sweetness from the shrimp that complemented the, the bitterness of that chocolate. And it the whole thing worked real well together. But again, it just goes back to understanding and knowing those flavors and then figuring out how to blend those things to make them together, whether it's with chocolate or, you know, anything else that you're making. If you're going to make, say, a mole or anything like that, it's kind of the same, same, same process. One of the chocolates that I didn't talk about is the, uh, the Mexican chocolate. And this is basically, this is the abuelita. This is the Mexican chocolate. And Mexican chocolate is unique in the sense that it's, uh, it's different than the, the normal chocolate that we eat today. Most of the chocolate that we eat is a refined chocolate. If you think of Hershey's, you think of Mars, you think of, you know, good, you know, good humor, but any of the chocolate bars that you could buy, they're very just smooth chocolates. You put them in your mouth, they melt. There's not a lot of, it's not a lot of hustle and bustle about it. They're just, it's just chocolate. The nice thing about the Mexican chocolate is what they do is they incorporate cinnamon, chilies and different things like that and it's a natural sugar in here so it's an unrefined sugar so you're really getting those notes and you can see I'll try to get a close-up for you I'll try to move it so you can kind of see some of it you can see how that natural sugar really comes out in it and it really is a is a is a kind of granulated granulated sugar but it works real well for a lot of things now you wouldn't necessarily want to turn around and try to make an icing or like a you know a ganache that you're going to do a cake with because of course you've got those granules that don't work very well with it but it works well in like if you wanted to do like Mexican hot chocolate if you wanted to make like a chocolate cake that would be a great chocolate for it because a lot of that stuff's going to get blended up in the cake it melts down very similar it works out real well in the sense of what that is so we're going to go back to our empanadas so I'm going to take the dough that we already have rolled out We're going to take, I'm just going to cut them off of here to make it a little bit easier to work with. So we've got our empanada dough. This is the, again, this is the white chocolate dough. I'm going to pull them off of here. So like I said, this has got the white chocolate incorporated in it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of our braised duck. Our braised duck, our braised, uh, our, our braised friend. I'm not using the name anymore. I'm not getting alls anymore. I think this is the most alls, or maybe I just hear it now because we're actually in here. So you can see it's not a lot of, a lot of the meat that's going into it because essentially what we want to make is, is a ravioli. We want to be able to fold this over, and I'm going to take a little bit of our water because that's really all you need. You can use egg if you want as well. Kind of get those edges wet, similar like if you were making you know, an Italian kind of ravioli and it was with pasta dough. We're going to fold that over, and then we're just going to Press and seal those edges. And then you could use a fork or you could turn around, you can use a knife if you wanted to and make like a nice little design or something into it. And this dough is already, and the, the, the dough itself, as you can see, as this dough sits, because it's that corn dough, it doesn't have that flour for gluten, it starts to dry. And that's why we're getting some cracking and stuff. But if you make these and then turn around and make them right away and then bake them, you can bake them, you can deep fry them, you can do a lot of different things with them. They come out pretty, pretty easy. What I'll do with this one is we'll try to get a little bit wet. And what happens is if they start getting dry like that, if you just put just a little bit of water on your fingers, kind of rub them down, it'll help bring that, that moisture back into that dough that you need. We'll take, again, a little more of our friend here. And again, we'll fold him back, fold it back over. 
and then we'll press it. So this gives us our empanadas. Now these are pretty much ready to go. They can go right into the oven. I've got uh, some prettier ones here that I had my, my sous chefs do earlier. But you can see, just getting a little decoration on them. They're really not that difficult to make. They actually make tortilla presses. So you can make that masa dough, and then you can press it with the tortilla between two pieces of parchment, and you can actually make them pretty quickly. Now, the filling can be anything you want. You can make these sweet. If you wanted to make, say, a chocolate filling, you can make this a chocolate and white chocolate empanada. You can really do a lot of different things with them to kind of change it and have a lot of fun with it. You can make them, again, these could be sweet. They could be savory. If you didn't do it with white chocolate, you could just make a straight maseca dough and, and turn around and make a very plain empanada with just some chicken that you cook down with maybe a little bit of arbol chili, a little bit of cinnamon. You could do like an, an enchilada sauce or some kind of red sauce to go over top of it. Again, you'd have a very, very good meal. And it's just something to kind of change up what we're doing and change up how we're eating. Um, next one we're going to do is we're going to do, let's see what I got here. We're going to make the white Mexican hot chocolate for you guys. So this one's a little different because most of the time, this is actually a first for us. And this is based on, again, because of the coffee bar, we wanted to really offer something different and something, something unique that you don't necessarily get. We wanted to do a white Mexican hot chocolate. Yes? The ones that would actually get ready to go into the oven, these were already brushed. You'd want to brush them with a little bit of, just a little bit of egg before they go in, or just a little bit of milk or something like that would work as well. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to dump out the water that I have here, and we're going to get this going. All right, so again, the process of this, We're going to take a little bit of whole milk. Now you can make this with skim milk if you wanted to make it, you know, a little bit less fattening for you. I'm going to do one because we're going to do two types. So I've got my white chocolate. Now to this one we make it a little bit different, you know, because we want to add some different flavors into it. Normally in our, in our Mexican hot chocolate that we do in the cafe, it's the Mexican chocolate, it's cinnamon, and it's a little bit of chili de arbol. So what we're going to do here is because we're making a white, we're still going to add the cinnamon. But I've got a little bit of um, pasillo peppers. And pasillo peppers are basically just smoked poblanos. Um, so we want to add a little bit of that smoky flavor to it. So I'm just going to kind of break them open, seeds and all, throw them in there. I'll throw one of the, pasilla, or one of the arbol chilies in. The arbol chilies are very, are very spicy, so I want to use them in moderation. But again, it's just a nice flavor contrast that you can add to your, to, your, um, to your chocolate. So what I want to do is I want to bring this up to just, just before it scalds. So right now all I'm doing is kind of blending all these flavors together, bringing it all up. I don't want to put my chocolate in yet. The last thing I want to add to this is my chocolate. I've got a little bit of sugar. We're going to put just a touch in it. You don't have to do as much with the white chocolate because if you look at the difference, the white chocolate, that's all sugar. That's your, your milk solids, and then that's your cocoa butter. Compared to, say, a regular dark chocolate or a medium chocolate, you have very little sugar. So as you can see the contrast, it's almost double. So you don't, want to, you don't necessarily need as much of the sugar when you're doing the, the, the white chocolate. You guys are going to get to taste this. We've got samples for you as you leave the theater today. So you'll get to taste the, um, I think they're doing the white chocolate, but it might be, the, it might be both of them. But if not, we have them both available in the, um, in the Mitsutam Espresso. And then in the cafe, we've got, you know, like I said, a whole conglomerate of, uh, of chocolates for you to taste. We've got uh, two soups over there. There's a, a chocolate soup with corn-dusted fried shrimp on top of it, a chocolate and habanero sh uh, soup. We've got a seafood chowder with a cocoa-dusted salmon with a chocolate bacon dust on top of it. So again, going into kind of that molecular gastronomy, using the bacon at the top of it to change it up a little bit. A um, couple of the tapas, we've got the, the empanadas are going to be on that station today. We've got, um, for a cold dish, because everybody's thinking, how do you do a cold dish? We've got a grilled romaine with a white chocolate aioli. So it's a white chocolate roasted garlic aioli with white anchovies. So... Again, you know, figuring out how you can incorporate that in there. We've got a 
grilled, grilled, um, grilled calamari with avocado salad with a white chocolate and champagne vinaigrette. Yeah, so there's a lot of different stuff like that that you can really try and really have a lot of fun with and kind of get outside of your comfort zone when it comes to like some of these things that you could try. And a lot of that stuff is literally just using the components of chocolate, whether it's using the cocoa nib or the cocoa itself, using the cocoa butter, using the actual different chocolates to be able to get, bring out different flavors and incorporate them in different ways. So it's kind of neat and fun. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to use our, our pitchers and we're going to use our Moliniños here. So this way we can kind of show you some of this, the frothness. And I don't know if I have a, I got a couple little glasses. We can put, a, put them in so you can see a little bit. So all we're going to do, like I said, we don't want to let this come up to a boil. We don't want to scald the milk. We just want to get it warm. And what that allows us to do is that allows it not, it allows it to froth. If we bring this up and scald it, we won't be able to froth it at all. So the fire goes off. I'm going to put in our, our white chocolate. We're just going to kind of let this melt down. And even when we make, like say for example, if we we're making a ganache or we we're making, you know, anything that has to do with chocolate even for sweets. Ganache is actually very easy to make. It's something anybody could do. Ganache is actually equal parts uh, heavy cream and chocolate. So, for example, if you bought a quart of heavy cream, a quart of heavy cream weighs how much? Does anybody know? Do you know? You knew earlier. A quart of heavy cream is two pounds. So for every, two, every quart of heavy cream, we would use two pounds of chocolate. If we used a half a quart, we'd use one pound. So it really just depends on what we're doing. But, you know, same, same process. We heat our milk up. We let, our, we let that come to a boil because we're using heavy cream. We pull it off, we add our chocolate in, and then we whisk our chocolate and let it melt, and then you have ganache. Once you let that cool, then you can make chocolate truffles. If you wanted to cover a cake, you could turn around and while it's still warm, ladle it over top of your cake or your cupcakes, and it would give you that ganache. Once it's cold, you could actually pipe it to make you know, a, a chocolate frosting or a chocolate icing or something like that if you wanted to. So it's amazing what you can actually do with the wonders of chocolate. So now, our chocolate's all melted. I'm going to pour it into our pot. All right, so now we get the Molinino, and we're going to just kind of go through and kind of roll that around. It's almost like those old drums that you would use that nobody could figure out as a kid, right? So we're just going to kind of move this around in there. And as it moves around, this is kind of not that much in here, so I'm going to do it one-handed. It'll it frosts that milk up, and you can you'll really be able to see how we're able to froth that milk. And then, like I said, it's just a kind of a neat trick. Now, this is how we actually make the hot chocolate at the espresso bar. So it was kind of you know one of the things we wanted to do is to have fun with it and really kind of show people you know and teach them and educate them. On, on how hot chocolate was actually originally made. Now, of course, we changed it a little bit, and we're doing the white hot chocolate. You can see you get a little bit of that froth on top. The ones that come out from the espresso bar actually come out with a lot more. But you can see how the, it, it really aerates the whole process. You know, and the white chocolate's nice because you get a little bit of that smokiness from that paseo pepper. You get a little bit of warmth from it. Um, and then you get the sweetness of that hot chocolate, so it really works out real well. So now with that one said, we're going to go ahead and make the regular traditional hot chocolate for you guys. And that one we're going to use again, we're going to use our, just our regular hot chocolate. We're going to use our Mexican chocolate. We're going to use the chili de arbol. I'm going to rinse my pot out here real quick. Does everybody know where chocolate comes from today? Or where most of our chocolate comes from, where it grows? Where? For a little bit. You know, chocolate is, it grows at about, um, it, gr it grows right around the equator. So anywhere where you have those moist tropical climates is where you're going to be able to get chocolate. So the biggest producers right now are in South America. Um, the Ivory Coast is a, is a very big producer of chocolate right now. They're really having the most success with the, with the chocolate or with the cacao, with the cocoa plants. It's difficult around here for us to grow it because we just don't have the humidity. We don't have the pollination. Now, they do bring some plants over that the, uh, they'll self-pollinate, which is kind of neat, so you can kind of get to see the plants 
and kind of learn about the history and culture behind it. There is a lot of history, a lot of culture. You know, chocolate is kind of gone through history as one of those great things that was given to us by the gods that we've been able to really enjoy. You know, chocolate at one point was traded as money. It was currency for them. They would actually use it to barter. So the beans would be worth money. So they could actually use it to buy things when it wasn't necessarily gold coin or anything available. So they were actually able to use it. So it's, it really goes back to how, you know, it really affects us as people and what we're able to do with it and how we enjoy it. You know, anybody that I think most anybody you talk to is going to tell you how much they love chocolate. And, you know, there's scientific studies on, on what it does to you and, and how it makes you feel. So there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of speculation out there, but it really does a lot to us. It can help you lift you up when you're feeling down, and it's a great, great flavor. You can really do a lot with it. So in here, we've got the cinnamon, we've got the Arbol chilies, and all I'm going to do is I want to let this actually come up to a boil, and I'm going to take some of our, uh, our Mexican chocolate, and again, because we're gonna we want that unrefined chocolate, so we're going to use some of the Mexican chocolate in there. Most, um, most grocery stores now actually have it in, they have a Latin market or a Latin part of it. And most of them have, you know, almost all of them have the, the cinnamon. This is actually Mexican cinnamon that we use, not the normal stuff you would see. And I don't, for those of you who kind of get a close up here, you can kind of see this is the bark off of the, the tree itself. But it's a lot more fragrant, it's a lot more potent than the normal cinnamon that we're getting. Most of the cinnamon and stuff that we buy is coming from India or Asia. But this is kind of nice. The Arbol chilies are usually available at all of them. And they almost look like the little Chinese red chilies, but they, you'll see them at the Mexican. Usually, like I said, I mean, I know the Safeway and stuff even by me now has a pretty large Latin component that has it. Um, you know, this is a Nestle's product, so even Nestle's has kind of jumped on board to realize that there's a, there's a huge market for it, not just, the, you know, not just the, the Latin markets any longer. So for about, we've got about, this is about, um, about 18, 16, 18 ounces. We're going to use about a, a puck and a half for that. And you can see this stuff's very, very hard. I mean, literally, got, I'm using the back of a knife to kind of break it up. You can see how hard, how hard it is to break. I mean, that's how dense it is. But it really adds a nice flavor to it. If you didn't have Mexican chocolate, you could still have the cinnamon and stuff. And you can use regular chocolate for it. The Mexican chocolate just really gives it a nice little uh, a nice flavor on, on it and adds those little subtle notes that you don't get off of that regular chocolate. Um, that's really all that goes into this one. We very, very simple in the sense that we don't we really try we try to make it as simple as possible, make it as easy as possible. The Mexican chocolate, we want it, the white Mexican, we wanted to add a few other flavors into it. Um, we're going to let this come up to a boil. While it's coming up to a, once it comes up to a boil, it's the same process. We're going to add in our, uh, our chocolate to it. And then we're going to just kind of stir this to let it melt. And as that melts, we're getting, it's, it's infusing all those flavors into it. I'll see if you can get a close up in there of that. But you can see even on top how there's a, that natural raw you know, sugar and stuff starts coming out into it. Yeah, is that enough? How's that? So you can see how that, you know, it doesn't necessarily blend together all the way smooth. It's starting to melt up pretty good. I'll bring it over as it gets a little closer. Got enough light. And you can see even in the chocolate how that chocolate actually kind of melts. It actually melts down in a kind of granular sense. You know, it really doesn't melt down like a normal refined sugar or refined chocolate would. You know, but it'll all it'll melt down smooth to where you get the flavors into it. Has anybody tried the Mexican hot chocolate from here before? <laughs> Couple people, right? That's good. Any questions so far about chocolate? This one you're going to want to add a little bit of sugar to, and I didn't put any in it yet, so thank you. <laughs> now, you could probably get away, depending on how, how sweet or how, you know, depending on how you like it, you could get away with not putting sugar in it. I mean, the Mexican chocolate has a pretty decent amount of sugar into it already. It just depends really on how much you like it and how much you don't. It's, an, it's a recipe that you really could kind of play around with and have some fun. I mean, I'm going to add probably, for this, probably about three tablespoons of sugar to it. Nice thing is, is if you didn't want to add regular sugar, you could do agave nectar in here. You could do honey. You could actually do maple syrup, which would actually be a nice kind of, 
you know, woodsy or nutty kind of flavor that would actually work real well with it. Um, you could use the Mexican sugar as well. The Mexican sugar, the only problem with that is that it's, um, it's very hard. So the, to break it up, it's, it's a lot to get in here. But uh, the Mexican sugar would be real nice as well in here. So once we kind of bring that together, get it all melted in. And you'll see, like even now, I'll bring it back over. You can see as it moves around, there's still kind of pieces of it that are still kind of floating around in there. It never really co gets co completely melted, which makes it kind of nice because it gives you a little texture and stuff for your tongue as, you, as you're drinking it. All right. So now from here, we're going to take our second pot. Two chilies in here and that's for about like I said it's probably about 20 ounces um, if you like it less spicy you could put less in it if you like it more then by all means put more I usually end up putting more in it because I like it a little I like a little bit of heat the nice thing is with the Arbol chilies though is you don't get the Arbol chilies are kind of nice in the sense that you don't get a huge amount of heat on the front part of your mouth from them the Arbol chilies really hit you kind of in the back part of your throat and it really comes after you're drinking the hot chocolate to get that flavor into it. So it's really kind of nice. So now it'll go in here. Now what we're doing at the coffee bar is we're taking basically all these ingredients and we're grinding them up and we're having a powder mix ready. So then we can basically just, you know, we steam our milk, we put our milk into here and then we we're able just to kind of pour it around and we actually melt the chocolate into the, into the, uh, into the milk that we're doing there. So, and you can see even on here, you know, you don't get as much of it. You still see a lot of that, that whole unrefined chocolate that's on there, a lot of those sugars and stuff that stayed on there. You know, unlike even with the white chocolate, where it melts completely clean. And that's because of that Mexican chocolate and that how, how it's so unrefined. So then we can take and pour that into our, uh, into our glass uh, bowl here. And you have the Mexican hot chocolate. Now, I can tell you on a nice cold day, there's nothing better than a glass of Mexican hot chocolate just because those chilies actually are great for warming you up just to give you a little bit of, you know, kind of just makes you feel warm all over, not only from the chocolate itself, but from all the way around. Um, any questions about anything? You could, like in the white chocolate, we use the pasilla because we want to add a little bit of that smokiness because it goes real well with the white chocolate. So really, you could add, you could add almost any chili you want. We use the Arbol just because it's not, it's a spicy chili, but it's not as bold in the front part of your mouth. Like I said, it just gives you a little bit in the back. And if it's hot, you know, the spiciness, then you add the chocolate and the pasilla. Would that not be a little In the pot, I put the cinnamon and the chilies, because you want to steep them in the milk to kind of bring out that flavor, and then you add the chocolate in at the very end. So there was milk in the yeah, milk was in there. Yes? There's, a, there's a, probably about 10,000 of them. I've got the, it's, <laughs> it's the, uh, I have one that I use a lot. I think it's the Chocolate Bible, which is a pretty decent one. Um, there's a couple books on the history of chocolate, which is kind of interesting because it really takes you back through the mind and the Incan ways of chocolate and kind of how they used it and what they did with it. So those are kind of interesting as well. The nice thing is, you know, we're talking about, you know, chocolate as in savories. And really, you know, the Mayan and the Aztec really used chocolates in a lot of their cooking, their everyday cooking. They made, you know, everybody here has heard of mole. Mole is, a, you know, a Central American or, you know, cooking technique or method where they would basically you know slow cook either turkey or chicken or whatever meat they had and they pretty much predominantly use chocolate in that dish all the time so they you know it's really something that's been used and it's been you know in cooking for a long time in one shape form or another to really end up with, with what we know as chocolate today so like I said I think the unique stuff that we get to do in the cafe with you know setting up a kind of a whole station with you know probably about eight there's, yeah, I think there's eight items and two soups, you know, that all have chocolate, chocolate in them in a savory aspect, not necessarily just a sweet aspect. Is this the, one? the Mexican hot chocolate is, the white Mexican chocolate is not. So yes, we should make another one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you could do the empanada by just using vegetables inside of it um, that would work for you, that would work real well. Um, you could turn around and make a, uh, you know, just do, you know, maybe a squash filling or something like that using the cocoa nibs, using the actual cocoa bean. You know, you saute off, saute off your vegetables in the cocoa butter, add the cocoa nibs in it. The cocoa nibs essentially are basically just ground down cocoa beans but they'll still give you that flavor. You could still make the same white chocolate empanada dough and then use that filling in it and it would work real well. Um, the other thing you could do is we make inside the cafe right now, we have a, a basically a masa cake to where you could take the same dough that we made here, actually make a cake out of it, sear it off, and then you can even take those vegetables and kind of go over top of it, do something like that with it that would work real well. Um, some other things, I mean, we've got a couple salads that we're doing. We've got a calabasa squash salad over there um, that's on the menu that we're doing for today that has a milk chocolate vinaigrette with it. So that would go real well. So it's got some red wine and stuff into it. Um, tofu you could probably use that would go real well with it as well. You could probably turn around and, and cook, do almost like a red wine chocolate you know, stew and add the tofu into that, and I think it would work real well for you. As far as finding the cocoa butter, you're – best bet is probably going to be looking online for it. Um, we're able to, through our sources and through some of our vendors, find it already done, but I would imagine online is going to be your best source for finding it, you know, just in general. I don't know of a lot of bake shops or a lot of places in the area that have cocoa butter. I don't, I'm trying to think of even if, like, you know, Trader Joe's or Whole Foods, I don't think I've ever even seen it. Any other questions? Those for chocolate covered strawberries, you really want to get a good chocolate. And the, the interesting thing about chocolate covered strawberries, whenever you do anything chocolate coated, you really want to get into what is the tempering process of chocolate. And what tempering means is tempering takes the chocolate, you want to bring out those natural oils or the butters of the chocolate back to the top. And that's how you can hold a chocolate covered strawberry in your hand for a few minutes and it doesn't melt. If you've ever noticed, you can set it in your hand and usually you're for about three or four minutes are good before it'll actually start to melt. It's because what they've done is tempering it. Now tempering is a, is a very finicky process in, in chocolate. What you have to do is you have to, you have to heat the chocolate to about 95 degrees and you have to cool it down to 85 and then you have to take it back up to 95. And in that process you're taking those cocoa butters and bringing them back up to the surface. If you're going to do it at home, you could use, I mean, almost any chocolate, really. I mean, you could even take, you know, a Hershey's chocolate bar. Like I said, you'd want to have a little bit of vegetable oil because you could thin it with a little bit of vegetable oil because Hershey's chocolate, the difference between very good chocolate and just okay chocolate is really in the melting of it and how it melts. Like this chocolate that we use, this is an 84% or 70, 74%, so it's a, it's a bittersweet, but even our 50% our chocolates, the 50% couvertures we buy, we buy in the little coins like this, it's a very good blend of chocolate. So when it melts, it melts down very smooth, it gives you a nice blend. So I would say like, you know, look for you know, a Valrona or something along that line at the grocery store that you can buy. Like I said, you can get away with the Hershey's, you can get away with like the cheaper bars, but you're definitely gonna need to thin it out and they're not gonna, they're not gonna hold up as well. The other key is when you're melting it down is really making sure you're taking care. The double boiler is usually the best because even in a microwave you can get some hot spots to where you'll actually pull it out and it'll look like it's seized up and it's because it actually burnt in the microwave. So usually a double boiler, just kind of working around. You see how fast that the white hot chocolate melts? It's the same thing. Once it starts to get to that, that stage, pull it off, work it around. If you've got to go back on for a second, go back on for a second, then bring it back off and then you can start dipping. Yeah, Mexican doesn't work as well just because, like I said, it's a very unrefined, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't go smooth. So it's going to look all bubbly and it's going to make it look kind of funny. Now what you could do is if you wanted to melt it down, you're going to have to thin it because it won't melt smooth like a, like a normal chocolate would. But you could dip it and then you could do like a white chocolate coating or something over top so that way it would kind of hide it. You probably have to dip it a couple times just to make it clear, but you could do it that way. 
um, it'd be, it, would, it would work for you. It wouldn't, like, again, it's just not as pretty when it melts. We've done um, actually like Mexican truffle pops where we'll make these down and make truffles out of them, and then we dip them in, like, a, a smooth dark chocolate just because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, like I said, it just doesn't look as pretty. Because they combine it in different amounts to make the different chocolates. So, for like I said, for this one, you know, this amount with the sugar and the, and the milk fat and the cocoa butter makes a milk chocolate. But if you look at like this one on the end, this would make a bittersweet chocolate. So the 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 advantage for the cocoa blender, the, the the chocolate producer, is he can control how much of each is in there to get the best. Now the cocoa butter, you know, for example, the cocoa nibs. You know, my cost on these is probably about nine dollars a pound. This stuff's about twenty-two. So imagine when you're when you're a chocolate maker, you you know, and then if you look at some of the the, the chocolates that aren't necessarily as good or a little un, that aren't as refined, then they'll add other stuff into their chocolates. Like they might not use one hundred percent cocoa butter. They might use modified fats or modified starches in there, along with some cocoa butter and everything else to be able to make it. But really, to have a true good chocolate, it should really only be those three or four ingredients that go into it. So that's where that's the advantage for the for the producer because they can figure out the blends and save money on it. Any other questions on chocolate? I'm sorry. Favorite chocolatier? I would say Jacques Pepin. He's, you know, he's classic. I mean, I grew up watching him on TV. I think the stuff that he makes, you know, I think is, is phenomenal. He's still a phenomenal chef. He's still a, a huge presence in the industry when you're talking about, you know, pastries and stuff like that. I mean, I've never seen him do anything that is, uh, that's, you know, uh, subpar or anything like that. I think, you know, when you're getting into those types of people, you know, I think he's really done well for the whole dessert, you know, and pastry aspect as well. But I think chocolate, he's really, he's really done well. Or Jacques Torres, I'm sorry, yes. Yes. So that would be he'd be he would be one of my favorites. But I mean they all I mean, working with chocolate is an art in itself. I mean, I I can do very you know, very little stuff. I can do, you know, meltdown chocolate, I can temper it a little bit, I can do chocolate covered strawberries, I can make tuxedos, I can do a lot of savory stuff with it, and I can bake with it, but really like the stuff when these guys are making sculptures and stuff, I mean it's really truly an art that you need to master like anything else. And it, you know, anybody that's doing it, my, I take my hat off to them because there's no way I could do it. I don't have that much time. I'm not that patient of a person. Yeah. As anybody that knows me would know. So. <laughs> so. All right. Any other questions about chocolate before we go? All right. Well, thank you very much. I know there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of other stuff going on in the museum. We've got the Mars Foundation out there doing a lot of, uh, chocolate stuff in the center of the Potomac, so please stop, stop, stop by, check it out, stop by the cafe, get to see some of our chocolate creations, taste some of our Mexican and white Mexican hot chocolate that we got in the coffee bar. Thank you guys very much for coming. Thanks all for coming. Let's give Chef Richard one more hand. Thank you everybody and enjoy the power of chocolate.